Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Things move fast in the AOC generation. History is 2017. So for a little perspective, we're going to take you back 29 years. It was still the modern era that we still had air conditioning. We still had air travel. 1990, America was different in some ways, though. And here's one of them. In 1990, 2,245 people were murdered in the city of New York. That's the highest number ever recorded in any American city, ever. And it turned out to be the peak of the worst crime wave in our history. Then Rudy Giuliani got elected mayor, policies changed, and crime began a very steep decline in New York. By 2001, the city of New York recorded just 649 murders, a remarkable change, really. Michael Bloomberg became mayor of New York the next year and made New York even safer. One of his main tools for doing that was a policy called stop and frisk. Essentially, it was this. The NYPD stopped suspicious-looking people, people they thought looked suspicious, asked them questions, and sometimes searched them for weapons and illegal drugs. Now, not everyone liked it, ever, but there's really no debate about how well it worked. It worked well. By 2013, Bloomberg's final year in office, New York City recorded just 333 murders total, all five boroughs for the year. It was officially America's safest city. It was a remarkable change. Mike Bloomberg was proud of that, and he was proud of stop and frisk. Today, we have fewer guns, fewer shootings, and fewer homicides. In fact, murders are 50% below the level they were 12 years ago when we came into office, something no one thought possible back then. And there is just no question that stop, question, frisk has saved countless lives. And we know that most of those lives saved, based on the statistics, have been black and Hispanic young men. Not just most, but the overwhelming majority have been in that category. Now, again, that was just 2013, not that long ago. You may even remember 2013. But today, Michael Bloomberg is trying to win the Democratic nomination. And you'd think that a party that claims to care about poor people would reward anyone who makes low-income neighborhoods safer. But no, they hate him for it. This is a policy that overwhelmingly put black boys, black men, and black and Latino men in prison, yeah. which was seen as a, as a civil rights violation. This is a mayor that provided over an administration that stopped and frisked every black, Latino, and poor person that they could. This is a man who actually ran New York City kind of like an oligarch and ultimately supported and defended a stop and frisk policy that essentially mass incarcerated black and brown people. I have three words, stop and frisk. That will be the thing that will be the problem for Michael Bloomberg. He still defends his policy of stop and frisk, which impacted families like mine. It was my cousins and my friends that were stopped on the New York City subway system and racially profiled and patted down. Oh, yeah. It affected Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's family. Ocasio-Cortez, by the way, grew up in Westchester County, New York, in a town that is more than 90% white. But she's telling us it's racist. And amazingly, Mike Bloomberg seems to agree with her. Now, last spring, Bloomberg blasted Joe Biden for his craven opening campaign, his apology tour, where he begged forgiveness for every good idea he'd ever supported. Now, it's Bloomberg's turn to do the very same. I got something important really wrong. I didn't understand that back then, the full impact that stops were having on the black and Latino communities. I was totally focused on saving lives, but as we know, good intentions aren't good enough. Back then, I was wrong, and I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, he's saying in the hostage tape you just watched. I was focused on saving lives when I should have been affirming the self-esteem of teenagers who carry loaded Glocks in public. That's what Mike Bloomberg just told you. That's what the Democratic Party is making him say. Now, the remarkable piece of this, almost stunning if you think about it, is that this very same Michael Bloomberg, the one you just watched apologize for stop and frisk, is also the single most aggressive and free-spending lobbyist for, wait for it, gun control in America. He would disarm suburbia tomorrow if he could, much less rural America. And yet now he's telling you that it was immoral for him to allow his own police department, the NYPD, to take thousands of illegal firearms off the streets of New York. Well, this is confusing as hell. What's the reasoning here? Well, there isn't any. Policies like these, and there are many of them, and they're popular now, from allowing drug addicts to shoot up on the subway to coddling vagrants as they squat on the sidewalk outside your house, 
These policies only make sense when you understand, in effect, what is the bigotry of the left. What's the bigotry? Well, they despise normal people. Law-abiding, middle-class Americans enrage them. If it makes your life better in some measurable way, they're opposed to it. Their sympathies are entirely with the destroyers. Bernie Carrick was once the police commissioner of New York City. He's seen the whole thing from the 70s to present, and he joins us tonight. Mr. Carrick, thanks very much for coming on. Did you ever think, Thank having you. in part presided over the single greatest drop in crime in American history, that there would come a point where politicians would apologize for being part of that drop? Well, I think it's, it is the apology tour. Uh, you know, when you run for president these days, that's what you do. Um, and, that, and that's what he's doing. I, I think it's disturbing, and especially for me, Tucker, I wasn't only the police commissioner of New York City. When I started out as a cop in Times Square, I was in uniform and I went to plain clothes. I was in an anti-crime unit. And your basic job in anti-crime, you're in plain clothes, you run around the city looking for guns, shots fired, burglaries in progress, any violent crime in progress, that's your job. And without stop for a question in frisk, we'd never be able to do that job. And I think Bloomberg and others like him that now denounce the policy, I think they forget how it started under Rudy Giuliani and the crime reductions, a 65 percent reduction in violent crime between 1994 and 2002, a 70 percent reduction in homicide under Rudy Giuliani. This is a time when mothers were putting their babies in bathtubs, yeah. scared to death of random gunfire. And I, I, I just think people forget how effective the policy was. And, and look, I think one thing that, that uh, people aren't, they, they don't realize, Bloomberg's apology may be because he overused the program. He overused the program. He had six times the amount of stop and frisks that we did under the Giuliani administration. Mm -hmm. So that may be a part of the problem. Maybe that's, maybe his, his heartfelt, uh, you know, apology is, is from abusing the program. Well, that wouldn't surprise me. But what does surprise me is the fact that Michael Bloomberg is, you know, the most aggressive gun control promoter in the United States and you know, still supports all kinds of authoritarian measures to keep people from defending themselves. Well, even the, I, I honestly security. believe this is a guy that would take every gun. Well, Every okay. gun so that exactly. wasn't so, in so, the hands so, of the government. So, so here, New York City, the, the largest city in the country, had the one gun control program that I'm aware of ever that has worked in America. And he's apologizing for it, but he's still for grabbing guns from everyone else. How, how does this work? No, it's, it's, it do, well, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The policy was effective. It was the most effective tool in the New York City Police Department to take that tool away. And, and listen, one more thing I want to I want to focus on. It's not just stop and frisk. It's stop, question, and frisk. It gives you the ability to stop, talk to somebody, encounter them, uh, have a conversation with them. You don't frisk everybody you stop. That's not necessary. But when a cop has an intuition or suspects somebody of being involved in a, a dangerous crime or a violent crime or possession of a weapon, they have to have the ability to check that person out because if they didn't, we'd have thousands of more young black and brown kids in New York City dead over the last 25 years. Yeah. This wouldn't affect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who, again, grew up in an affluent suburb of Westchester. But for the people who actually live in tough neighborhoods, yeah, that, that I think would have an effect. Commissioner, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Tucker, thank you. Well, the left's offensive against law and order isn't just directed at past policies. Last week, Congresswoman Ayanna Pressley of Massachusetts unveiled her version of a Green New Deal, but this is for crime. It's a big plan. There's a lot. We could spend all hour talking about it, but some of its provisions include these. Ban life sentences, all life sentences. Ban the prosecution of minors as adults. Okay. Legalize prostitution. Decriminalize the theft of, quote, necessary goods. Remove police from public school and far more. It even includes a provision for reparations based on skin color for good measure, though it's not clear what that has to do with justice because, of course, it's the opposite of justice. Ian Samuel is a former Supreme Court clerk, and he joins us tonight. So, Ian, thanks so much for coming on. This is a, this is a big uh, proposal. Some of it probably is non-crazy. A lot of it is crazy. I mean, it's sort of hard to generalize about it. But let's just take a couple issues in there specific because sure. I think they're interesting. One is decriminalizing prostitution. So how can we be against human trafficking, which is really another word for abetting prostitution, 
and yet decriminalize prostitution. Is the idea that women are prostitutes because they want to be, because they think it's like a great deal for women? What is the idea? Well, you don't, have, you don't have to necessarily believe that. Some people do think that, and I think there's reasonable disagreement about the extent to which anybody is really free when they're selling their labor under capitalism. But that's kind of a side issue. Uh, but what you can ask is, is the best way to do something about human trafficking to criminalize the people who are being trafficked and what they're doing, or do you want to go after it at a different level? And to me, it actually makes a great deal of sense to say, if you're the person being trafficked, we don't want to make your life worse. We'd like to help you, not threaten you with jail. We want to right. go after the people like you know Epstein and you know Trump and the Clintons and everybody else or, who's actually doing the trafficking. Or, Prince Andrew, or, the, all or, of the, them. or the pimps. I, I guess yeah. here's, here's, here's the bottom line principle, which is always true. When you criminalize something, you get less of it. Now, some things shouldn't be criminalized just on principle. But the truth is, like, cirrhosis deaths went way down under prohibition. No one wants to say that, but it's real. So if you legalize prostitution, when you legalize people camping on the sidewalk, you get a lot more of it. And that affects the lives of everyone else. So what about their rights, I guess is my question. Well, I'm not sure you get a lot more. I mean, of course you're gonna have, every policy is gonna have some effect, but the question you have to ask is, Putting somebody in a prison, a dungeon, that's a big, big idea, right? That's a big intervention. And you have to ask, is this, you know, say you've got somebody who's sleeping on the street or they're urinating in public because they don't have anywhere else to go to the bathroom. Now, I agree, if you threaten to put those people in jail, you may get a little less of it. But you have to ask, is that really the way you want to solve, like, well, public I don't know. urination it all and not having it all, a place to go to the bathroom? It all, it all depends. I mean, so, like, let's say I live, if people are camped out on my sidewalk, defecating in front of my front door, and I've got little kids... Mm -hmm. I mean, I have rights here, too. So having yes. the ability to say, you know what, go do it somewhere else. You can't do it here. I worked hard for this house. Buzz off. Leave. You're freaking my kids out. Like, a normal society recognizes the right of a person to say those things. But the left doesn't totally, because no, they I side totally, wholly yeah. with the deviant 100% of the time. It's the person who gives the finger to society who tries to tear down what the rest of us have built. They're on his side every time. Well, I don't know about that. I do think going to the bathroom is actually not such a deviant behavior, but I agree with one thing you said, which I agree with one thing you said, which is we can't have a society where we just treat as normal, hey, a lot of people just have to go to the bathroom on the sidewalk because they don't have any other place to do it. I right. just don't think the right answer is, well, we're going to put you in jail and you can go to the bathroom there. Like, that's that's a solution. It's just not a very good one, nor is it and, particularly and actually, kind, I'm not arguing for that. anything else. What I'm arguing is that when you, quote, decriminalize or decriminalize theft, as they have in California, what you're basically saying is the chaos that the tech oligarchy has given us is like totally normal and okay. And if you complain about it, you're against civil rights, when in fact, if you complain about it, you're just a normal person who wants to live in an orderly, clean society. Oh, what, are you going to criminalize the theft of bread? You don't like Les Miserables? I mean, what, what are you talking about? I mean, and by the way, the tech guys are the ones that hate the new San Francisco DA the most, which is a reason to love him if there ever was one. Yeah. The tech guys created the feudal society that we're watching destroy that city. But anyway, Ian, great to see you tonight. Thanks so much. Nice to see you. Thanks. Well, the Democratic Party's dramatic lurch to the left on, well, pick an issue, crime and everything else, seems to have even Barack Obama, who started it, worried. On Friday, Obama warned a room full of liberal donors that most voters out there actually don't want a radical revolution in America. Watch this. We are uh, bold in our vision. We also have to be rooted in reality. They like seeing things improve, but the average American doesn't think that we have to completely tear down the system and remake it. And, and I think it's important for us not, not to lose sight of that. Now, you may have forgotten, but Barack Obama won two elections in a row, pretty comfortably both times. Now, he's too far right to get the Democratic nomination. That's not speculation. It's literally true. The party's cadre of Red Guards would not have him. Case in point, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar tweeted this on Saturday, quote, if being too far left, hashtag illiterate, believes, means believing health care is a human right, future generations should live on a healthy planet, all student debt should be canceled, the minimum wage should be $15, lives depend on gun reform and families don't belong in cages, comma, count me in, exclamation point, arm flexing emoji. Richard Goodstein is a lawyer and former advisor to Bill and Hillary Clinton. He joins us tonight. So are you for the exclamation point and the arm flexing emoji? Does that describe your feelings on the subject? Uh, I think in this case, Ilhan Omar is a really...